Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas Branco. Uh, I'm a compliance advisor here um, at the ISSO. Very excited to have you all this morning. Hi, everyone. My name is Noelle Willica, and I am the Assistant Director for Student Services at ISSO. Hi, everyone. So glad to be here. My name is Mark Mejia, Senior International Student Advisor here at the ISSO. Awesome. So yes, um, as I mentioned, we're very, very thrilled to be welcoming you all um, for the upcoming term. Um, and I imagine that you all are very eager to arrive and begin your studies. Um, and so just know that we are looking forward to um, guiding you through the I-20 process um, and helping you out through the student visa process as well. And so moving forward um, and getting started, um, this is going to be the agenda for the morning. Um, we're going to run through the slides a little bit. Um, and talk about the I-20 application process specifically. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, the processing times. And then we'll go into some of our frequently asked questions. And then um, towards the end of the presentation, um, that is when we will go into the live Q&A um, and we'll be able to answer some of your questions. And yes, so yeah, let's get started with the I-20 process. Um, so to begin the process to get your I-20 from our office, you're going to want to make sure that you're that you first confirmed um, your acceptance to the university, and then once it's been confirmed, that's when um, you can go into the I-20 process. So the I-20 process can roughly be put into four different stages. Um, you're going to start with preparing your supporting documents, logging into Compass, and submitting an application, um, and then receiving your I-20. And then you'll um, after you receive the I-20, you'll go and apply for the visa. Um, in terms of those. Sorry, everyone. Um, okay. Um, sorry for that. Um, and so in terms of the supporting documents, um, there are generally going to be about four that you'll want to prepare. So that's going to be the admission letter from your academic department, your passport, your evidence of funding for the first academic year. And then also if you're doing funding from like a family sponsor or an individual sponsor, for example, you wanna make sure that you also submit the sponsor certification form. Um, and then after you've again, confirmed your intent to enroll and then you've gathered your supporting documents, you'll log into Compass to submit the complete I-20 application. And then once your application is actually complete, we'll review it. Um, and we'll follow up with you in the event that additional information or documentation is needed. And then um, if your documentation and application is sufficient, we'll go ahead and issue the I-20 to you. And then that is when you can go ahead and begin the visa student process to get, your, um, to get the F-1 visa from the embassy. So moving on to the next slide, um, we're going to segue into the I-20 and visa processing timeline. Um, again, once we receive your complete application, um, we'll follow up if additional information is needed, but um, so that will usually, the actual review will take, um, it'll be done within two weeks. So upon you submitting the application, uh, we'll follow up with you within two weeks, um, either to collect additional information or to go ahead and issue the I-20 for you. Um, once you're Applica Once your application is approved and you receive the I-20, you'll also get a detailed information with um, next steps, kind of helping you um, as you go to the visa and prepare for your arrival as well. Um, on your I-20, you'll get something called a CBIS ID number, and this is something that you'll need when, you, um, when you're applying for the student visa, so just keep that in mind as well. Um, we um, always recommend applying for the I-20 at your earliest convenience, um, and this is just because visa processing times can vary depending on the embassy and depending on the individual circumstance, so um, just keep that in mind um, as you all are um, planning for your arrival. In terms of the actual visa processing, um, it, again, it does vary by location. Um, it can generally take anywhere from one to six weeks or even potentially more after the actual visa interview to process the, the, the request. Um, and so it's really kind of dependent on the individual circumstances and the specific um, requirements of the embassy. So just keep all of these things in mind um, as you are planning for your arrival. Um, 
the visa website does offer a wait time calculator. So you're able to look up um, your local embassy to gauge what their current visa processing times are, and you'll be able to plan accordingly um, for that. And some of you also may be asking, um, what if you already have an expired F-1 visa? Um, so you all can continue to use the unexpired F-1 visa if you've studied at an institution in the US previously. So just keep that in mind. Um, Again, if if you've studied at a previous if you've studied at an institution previously on an F one visa, you can still use it if it's unexpired. Um, but just keep in mind, you would still need to apply for the I twenty um, with our office in this scenario. Um, and yeah, so after once again, after you, you um, receive your I twenty, you'll be able to apply for the visa. And then once you um, receive your visa, that's when you can start preparing for your arrival to the U S. Um, and lastly, um, the QR code um, is a link to the I-20 page um, that has a lot of um, more detailed information in terms of like the supporting documentations um, and some of the other things related to the visa as well. So I'll go ahead and pass it back over to Don for our next session section. Thanks, Nicholas. So now I'm just going to go over a few of the common questions that we receive from newly admitted students. So the first question we are often asked is what a student should do if they are still waiting for funding. So in order for us to issue an I-20 to a student, the student does have to have sufficient funding to cover their program expenses. Uh, it is okay to apply for uh, your I-20 with the sources that you currently have available. Uh, your, your funding sources can change later after you have received your I-20. Uh, you would still just want to make sure to take the funding sources that you applied for the I-20 uh, with to your visa interview. Another question uh, that our office is often asked is whether we can assist with helping a student uh, schedule an earlier visa appointment. So unfortunately, schools aren't able to expedite or, influ or influence the visa application process. But I will say the good news is, is that so far we aren't seeing really the backlogs and delays that we uh, were seeing the, uh, in 20, last year and in 2021 at US embassies and consulates. Uh, and additionally, there usually is a process uh, in which you can request an expedited appointment with a US embassy or consulate if it's close to your program start date. Uh, you would want to consult directly with your local U.S. Embassy or consulate about the expedite uh, visa appointment uh, process just because it can vary depending on the location. Uh, and then another question we are often asked uh, is from students who are currently studying in the U.S. about the process of transferring their uh, CFIS record to Columbia. And so we do have on our website a uh, applying for your transfer I-20 page that has important information about the CVIS transfer process. We included on this slide a QR code uh, in case there are any transfer students attending this webinar today. So if you scan that QR code, uh, it will take you to that applying for your transfer I-20 page uh, and you can review the information there. Just an important thing to note as a transfer student, uh, if you do not have to depart the US between programs, and also, you do not have to travel to renew your visa if you, tra if you transfer your CFIS record. And then one last question uh, that we are often asked is about uh, issues logging into uh, Compass, which is where you would find our online I-20 application. So there are two ways to access Compass after you've confirmed your enrollment uh, with your school's admissions office. The first way is with your Columbia Uni. Um, and if you haven't received that yet, then you can also access Compass using your Columbia PID, which is the ID number starting with the letter C. Uh, the unis and PIDs are assigned by a school's admissions office. So if you haven't received this information yet, you would need to wait uh, for your school to provide it, or you could follow up if it's been a decent amount of time since you've confirmed your enrollment. Uh, but once you have your uni or PID, you should be able to access Compass with either. And so now we're going to open it up uh, to the live Q&A. Uh, just please know, unfortunately, we can't answer case-specific questions, but certainly any general questions, um, feel free to, I guess, raise your hand. Uh, and I know there's also questions maybe in the chat. And we will try to, um, you know, we will we'll be happy to answer what we can. Oops. 
Um, hello. Hi. Hi, um, this is Tarika, and uh, I applied for the Masters in Architecture and Urban Design program, which starts in May, uh, May th on May 30th. And uh, I'm wondering if the visa, you know, will get processed by then, or will it take time? Because it's it's not it's one and a half months left. I'm so sorry. I think I, I didn't catch the last part of your question. If you don't mind repeating it. Um, since the course starts pretty early because it's on, on May 30th and, you know, I need to get my visa at least done by May, mid of May. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if I apply now or maybe by next week, will I receive my visa by then or if I have to request you to like tell the embassy to give it earlier or like, how is it? Because what if I don't receive? Yeah. Sorry, so are, are, so we issue the I-20. Um, so have you applied for your I-20 yet? Um, no, not yet. Okay, so I will say we do try our best to expedite I-20 applications for summer, uh, mm -hmm. since we know that your program's starting soon. So most likely our processing time would be less than the two weeks um, it, that was you know mentioned earlier because you do have a summer program and we do try to expedite those. Now, after you get the I-20, then you would need to contact your local embassy or consulate about their expedite visa uh, appointment process. Unfortunately, it really varies depending on the embassy or consulate. So I don't know uh, what you know the requirements would be uh, for your where you would be applying, but you could certainly check with your embassy or consulate to find out uh, what the process would be to request an expedited appointment. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Conrad? Um, hi, uh, I was wondering, uh, does the process differ at all for Canadian citizens? Um, as I've had a couple friends who are Canadians that study in the US and they've done it at the port of entry or um, is it, do we, can we apply it in embassy instead? Great question. So uh, Canadian citizens are exempt from applying for the visa stamp in their passport. So you would still need to apply for an I-20 with our office. Uh, but then as a Canadian citizen, you can use that I-20 and your Canadian passport to enter the U.S. and F-1 status. So you actually would not need to apply for a visa stamp at a U.S. embassy or consulate. You just need the I-20. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I have a question. Sure. Sorry, I can't uh, see everyone's I'm, hand. So feel free, anyone else on ISSO, if you can see all the hands, feel free also to call on people. Virtually, I can only see a sliver of the windows, but sure, go ahead. Yeah, no problem, thank you. Uh, my question, I've, I've also been admitted to the MSAUD program, the Urban Design Program. I wanted to ask, what's the adequate funding amount that I need to show for the I-20 form? My tuition fee is close to $100,000 currently. Which so I won't. Sorry, yes. I'm oh, sorry. So I don't have. Uh, if you go to our website, I don't have all our numbers memorized, unfortunately. But if you go to our website, uh, the applying for I-20 page, and then you click on the estimated expenses link, then you'll see uh, it's there's a breakdown by schools. You'll click on the architecture link. You would want to refer to the total expenses column for that. Would be the amount you would need to show in your uh, for your when you apply for your I-20. Right. The total. The total entire amount, including all expenses. So yeah, to issue the I-20, we need to see uh, sufficient funding that covers tuition fees and living expenses. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome. And I also posted the estimated expenses link um, in the chat for everybody, um, just in case anyone needs to reference. Perfect, thank you. I mean, if it's helpful, I see some questions in the chat as well. Would you want me to read those out for you? Oh, that would be great. Thank you so much. Mark. Fantastic. So I see one from Elise. Will I need to transfer my CVIS if I have an unexpired visa from my undergraduate, i.e. not a transfer student? So, I, so if I'm understanding this question correctly, you've completed your undergraduate studies are no longer studying in the U.S., but you have an unexpired F-1 visa. Is that correct? That's correct. I'm on my OPT right now. 
Oh, okay. So you actually, as a student on OPT, you can still transfer. Um, just keep in mind your OPT will end on your transfer date and you can no longer work. So just uh, be mindful of that uh, when you arrange your transfer. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Yeah. The next one, it looks like was from Jessica wondering about the visa for a Canadian. I think that was addressed. So I'll move on to the following question, but Jessica, let us know if there's still follow up on that. Um, this is from Benedict. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I want to ask if it's a, if I must pay the deposit fee before I can apply for the I-20. Um, so for the for the processing fee, um, you can begin the application. You don't have to like pay the fee before you can actually start it. But in order to like have it submitted and it count as like a complete application, you would need to pay. Um, Oh, the processing fee. Um, I do see, actually, I'm reading further, it does say the deposit fee. Um, and so um, in theory, yes, you would, because you would that would be the way of confirming your admission. Um, and after you've confirmed your admission, that's when you'll be able to apply for the I-20 um, in Compass. Yeah, Nicholas, I, I can chime in here as well. So after you confirm um, by submitting your deposit, that allows you to activate your uh, student account. So you will need to be confirmed in order to actually access Compass. It will take a couple of days, so it's not immediate as well. It looks like the next question from Fozan. Thank you for the session and presentation. I would like to ask a couple of questions. I need to confirm accept since before DS 2019, does the deposit need to be paid to? And the second part of the question is, how long would the DS 2019 be processed and shipped to my home country in Indonesia? So I'm just confirming that um, you will have to submit your deposit in order to um, process the enrollment and and that will activate your student account and that will generate your uni. So once you do that, um, you'll be able to access Compass. You will not be able to access Compass if this hasn't been processed. I think there's a second part to that question. If some... I, I can answer that. So um, the DS2019 DS shipping times uh, can vary. So unfortunately, I can't give an exact estimate, but if you were uh, coming for a summer program, again, we would try our best to expedite the application once we receive it, uh, especially because right now the DS2019 still needs to be mailed. Um, but it, I, I would say generally, I believe the shipping time is between five to seven days after we issue it, the DS2019. Uh, and we do also uh, email the CVIS ID number for the DS2019 in advance so that you would be able to schedule your visa appointment before you got the physical document. Um, you just would want to make sure you have the document at by, you know, by the time you go to your appointment, but you would get that in advance. So um, you can schedule the appointment right away once it's issued. Here we have the next question, Suez Suezia. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hi, can I continue working under OPT even after transferring my I-20? I can jump in and uh, thank you, MC Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so for questions about OPT, um, you, if you're, it sounds like you're currently under um, a visa status with another school and you're on OPT with that school. So this is a great conversation to have with the student advisors at your current school. They're going to assist you in transferring your CVIS record to Columbia University. And something to know about OPT is that when that transfer occurs, that cuts off your OPT employment authorization. So a great question and a really good conversation to have with your current student advisor. And you can also, after going through this process, you can talk to our team at ISO at Columbia EDU to talk more about using potentially OPT in the future. Thanks, Noel. Here we have the next question from Rune Maya. And it looks like a popular one. There's two thumbs up on it. Hello, I have received my I-20 and already submitted my visa application online. However, there is an issue with the US Embassy website and it seems difficult getting an appointment. I have a summer program as well. Is there any way you can assist in this matter? 
So unfortunately, we, we aren't able to expedite visa appointments or influence that process. I would recommend um, if there's if you uh, can find the contact page at, on the your embassy or consulate's website um, and reaching out to them and then confirming uh, what their requirements are for expedited appointments. Uh, some embassies might say you can request an expedited appointment once you're in within 15 days. Some may say you can request the appointment once you're in within 30. It really can range. Um, but I would recommend reaching out to them to see uh, when you could request uh, an expedited appointment and just letting them know that your program is starting in May and, you know, hopefully they'll be able to assist you. You can also email us uh, at that new intel student at columbia.edu address if you're really running into problems. And we can certainly try to navigate, you know, maybe assist with where on your website, your consulate or embassy's website, you can find the information. But unfortunately, we would not uh, directly be able to influence or, or, or request an expedited appointment on your behalf. Thank you, Don. Here we have the next one from S. Kinder. Can we apply for an I-20 if we only have partial funding for now? Um, I can I can take this one. Um, so in terms of partial funding, um, we wouldn't be able to issue the I-20 with partial funding because we do need um, evidence of funding for the entire first academic year. So the first two semesters to be specific. Um, and so um, if you do submit with partial funding, most likely it'll be placed in follow-up. And, and so we'll follow up with you to ask for that additional information and documentation. Um, and then once you're able to provide it, we'll be able to continue processing the I-20 application from there. Great, thank you. Here we have the next one from Jishnu. Can there be multiple sponsors? Yes, multiple sponsors, uh, that's completely fine. Um, the next question here, is there a way in which we can have access to the recording of this meeting as um, I missed the start? Yes, the meeting is currently being recorded and we'll be able to publish this on the website um, in the coming days. So we'll definitely reach out and let you know via email when that's available. Thank you. It looks like the next two questions are referencing the link, Nico, that you had sent to the chat. Thank you for that. Um, maybe some navigation issues about finding their specific programs. Oh, okay, I see, I see. I think I can answer that, Nicholas. So okay. if um, your program isn't specifically on there, just use the top portion, the architecture planning and preservation, because the other programs, it looks like they are for the three semester programs. Thank you. Thank you. The next question it looks like is from Sanjana. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I had a question about the visa. I did a summer course last year, six weeks at UC Berkeley. And because of that, I have an F-1 visa for five years, which ends in April, 2027. My previous program is over, but I still have the F-1 visa. So do I have to transfer my I-20 or do I have to start a new process? Great question. So in this uh, situation, um, you can still use that F-1 visa stamp because it's unexpired, but you would need to apply for a new I-20 with a new CVS ID number. So you, you wouldn't be able to transfer your CVS records since your program's already ended, uh, but you can still use that F-1 visa stamp as long as it's unexpired with a new I-20 for um, from Columbia. Thanks, Don. Here we have a question from Conrad. If we're on an I-20 slash F-1, are we only permitted to work during the summer? Yeah, great question. So uh, in your program of study, and just to preface, this also sounds a little bit like you're interested in working off campus outside of Columbia University. So in your program of study, you are required to complete one academic year successfully first. So that means two semesters of full-time enrollment. So if you're starting in the fall, it'd be a fall in the spring. And that's just one example for fall admits. And then you would be eligible to work off campus following the, the summer in the summer. 
Within your academic program, you likely have the option to work through something called curricular practical training, which we call CPT. And that means that the internship that you do over the summer is related to your coursework. So that means it's connected to an actual internship course. There, there are rules around this course as to when you can take it and how often you can take it and also how many credits are connected with this course. This can vary by the program that you're in. So even within the entire School of Architecture, the curriculum for each one of the different programs might vary slightly. So you're going to hear students talk about it. It's a great question to ask, but you want to speak with someone at the university to find out specifically for you what your options are. So we would recommend speaking with your academic department first to learn about the course. When is it offered? How often can you take it? And how many credits are do you need to take for that course? And then you can speak with ISSO about getting the actual employment authorization and getting the CPT so that you're able to do the internship. Thank you, Noel. Here we have the next question. Hello, thank you for the informative presentation. I was wondering if you could help me with a question regarding funding approval. Specifically, I'm curious to know if the approved amount needs to be saved in an American account and in dollars assuming American dollars. Additionally, I was wondering if there are any requirements to freeze the account for a period of time once the funding has been deposited. Uh, so uh, I'll try, I think that's three questions. Let me make sure I answer all three. So the first one, um, no, it does not need to be in a US bank account. In fact, I would say the majority of students uh, funding documents are not in US banks. Um, it does not need to be in US dollars. It can be left in uh, whatever the original currency. We will do a conversion when we uh, process your application and uh, the funds do not need to be frozen. Thank you, Don. Here we have the next question. Would you recommend applying if we only have partial funding? I mean, you certainly, I, we do generally recommend, um, if especially if students have concerns about whether their funding is acceptable, to just apply so that we can review it. Um, and then the ISSO advisor who's processing your application will email you directly with specific instructions about what else is needed uh, to you know to issue the I-20. Um, so if you submit an uh, application with partial funding, it would be reviewed and then the advisor would contact you uh, letting you know what else you would need to show before we'd be able to issue the I-20. Great, the next question. I have a follow-up question regarding transferring the CVIS number leading to termination of my OPT. I plan to work until the end of July. Is there a date by which I need to do this transfer by? So I, I, I don't, uh, I'm not sure which program you're in. I'll just say generally the transferring process needs to be completed before you begin studying at Columbia. Um, so if you were in a summer program starting in May, you would need to transfer before you start studying, you know, at the end of May, May 30th, I believe is when your program begins, uh, the summer programs begin. So that would need to, your, your CVS record needs to be transferred before that. If you're starting in fall, then it's okay to, you know, tr it, to transfer after you complete, you know, stop working in July, that would be okay. But again, it really depends on when uh, your program starts. So that might be a question just to email to us at the new Intel student address uh, if you aren't sure and just so we can confirm directly uh, when you would need to transfer by. Thanks, Don. And it looks like there may have been an audio issue. Could you please repeat if we need to freeze the account for a time period or not? No, you do not need to freeze funds. Great, and I think in terms of the chat, we have reached the end of the questions. We do have a little bit more time, so if anyone wants to chat anything else or raise their hand, please feel free to do so now. I think we're all set. Don, Nico, Noel, I don't see anything else. Great. Could you actually, um, I know that a couple of students have asked um, when could they start working? Don, I think it, maybe you touched upon that. So if they wanted to um, apply for um, student employment, um, can you talk a little bit about how that works in the first semester, if that's possible? Or is it, um, Noel, did you say that uh, they have to wait until the second semester? 
Yeah, of course. So uh, students are required to complete two semesters first of academic study. So a student will have to be enrolled full time for two semesters. So the example I used earlier was for fall admits. So the example for fall admits would be they would complete in the fall and then complete in the spring, and then they'd be eligible to work off campus in the summer. The, there are two different types of off-campus employment authorization, but I would say the most common uh, while you're studying and the one that's typically preferred by students is to use CPT. And so that's when you would want to speak with your department about that internship course, um, what's connected to the course, how many credits is it, uh, what's the process of applying for it with um, the department. And then also you can look at the ISO website about CPT. We'll do the final authorization of it, but it must first be approved by the academic department and the course registration must go through first. Um, students, of course, are also welcome to reach out to us individually and we'd be happy to review anyone's CFIS record and review their program of study because, as I said earlier, CPT um, is course-based, so it's very slightly depending on the program that a student's in. Um, and also students might not be interested in CPT. They may be interested in maybe using uh, the other type of employment authorization, which is called OPT. And maybe they wanna use that a little bit earlier in their program of study. So we'd be happy to talk to students through that. Um, generally speaking, we'd recommend, you know, focusing on the I-20 application process, getting your student visa, entering the US. Uh, we know that your study is your primary purpose of being here and your main goal. So once you've arrived and once you're settled into your classes, that's a great time to either schedule a Zoom appointment or an in-person appointment or just send us an email with your questions. And then we'd be happy to really look into your uh, record and what your options are. Thank you for repeating that, Noelle. Of course. It looks like there was a there's an additional question. And actually, before we move on, I can add just really briefly to what Noel said, just in case anyone was interested in working on campus, you are actually eligible to engage in that after you enter the US in either F1 or J1 status. So you, you thankfully won't have to wait to work on campus if you're interested in doing that. Just keep in mind, there are some limitations in regards to the number of hours you can work. So during any required academic semester, um, it's gonna cap out and max out at 20 hours per week. And here we have the next question. I received PID number two days ago. However, when I tried to request limited services PIN using my PID number, the system says there is no record matching my PID number. Should wait for more time? Should I wait for more time for the system to register my PID number? So that would depend on when you um, submitted your um, enrollment deposit. So usually it's a couple of days after that, um, and then you would have to activate your um, uni in order to um, gain access to Compass with, with your PID. And if you want to just email us at arch underscore admissions, I can check on that for you. I'm going to add the um, email right here. Thank you. The next question, sorry I missed your response. Uh, would you recommend applying if we only have partial funding? It's okay to apply with partial funding. I, it's, you know, I it really, it's also, I must dependent on your individual circumstances. If you want to apply or if you want to wait until you have everything, but if you apply with partial funding, we will contact you and let you know uh, what else is needed. And then uh, your application would, would sit in a stage uh, that's called follow-up. And you would get uh, reminder emails from our system periodically uh, just to submit the additional documentation when you have it. Thank you. The next question, what would happen if the visa isn't processed by the time the summer program starts? You can just check in with us. Um, we'll work with you and reassess when, when that happens. But um, just please, um, start your paperwork as soon as possible and keep in touch with us. And we reached the end of the, the questions in the chat again, Don. Thank you.
And we have the email here if there are some questions that um, you're not thinking of now and perhaps want to ask later. Um, I'm just going to type it in here. It's it's on the screen, but um, if you just want to link to it, I'm just going to type it in the chat. And if it's helpful too, Sarah, I can just mention, just in case you're wondering why there's two email addresses. So um, basically, because we have such a huge population here at the ISSO, at the Columbia, actually, the ISSO is split into various teams. So we have one team that works with students prior to arrival, and then we have another team that works with students after they arrive. Um, that being said, you know, the reason four of us are here is just because we want to try to best ensure that you know, your experience with the ISSO isn't fragmented. It doesn't feel siloed in any sort of way. Um, so that's why there's there's four of us, just in case you were wondering why we have such a um, <laughs> relatively large number for this presentation and why there's two email addresses there. Well, if we don't have any questions, um, we can take a break. Um, Oh, I, I do see another one. Oh, MS Computational Design Practice Program has online session for the first portion of the summer semester. I wonder if I can enter the US after online session is over regarding visa. Yes, so you can enter 30 days before the start of the uh, in on campus portion of uh, your summer term. That's an unusual program, so I'll just add one one more note to that. It's yeah, the the first uh, the first component in the summer for for only the computational design practices program is not uh, there is no physical presence required. So you do not need to be in the U.S. Uh, May thirtieth for computational design practices. Yes, I believe you start early July. Or the... Correct. I think July fifth is the first in person class day. Yeah, so that would be the start date uh, on the I-20 for any students admitted to that program. Anything else? The chat is completely empty, I guess. Um, are we all set? That's what happens when you have four people. Um, it's so efficient <laughs> that you just answer answer all possible questions. Well, we we're so happy to be here. I can say on behalf of you know our team on the ISIS. So you know we look forward to welcoming you all. Very exciting. Congratulations on getting this far. And um, just uh, thank you all for being here as well. I'm sure it may be a different time depending on where you are as well. And thank you for the great questions. It's really always helpful for us to hear what students have questions about. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Bye now.